So if you don't know about Cyan already, just wanted to quickly comment on who we are as an organization. Cyan believes that therapies of depth, insight, and relationship are based on three core ideas. First, that there's more to people than they often recognize. Second, that knowing yourself in new ways leads to more effective and meaningful living. And third, that the therapy relationship offers a space in which people can learn to trust, grow, and thrive. Our core mission is to advocate for awareness, policies, and access to psychotherapies that create lasting change. So as you all know, today we're meeting with Dr. Farhad Dalal. He's a British psychotherapist and group analyst working with individuals, groups, and organizations. He's been in an independent practice for more than 30 years, initially in London and now in Devon. Dr. Dalal has written several books, including CBT, The Cognitive Behavioral Tsunami, Managerialism, Politics, and the Corruptions of Science. Dr. Dalal writes, teaches, and lectures in Britain and internationally. He's a visiting professor at the PhD School, Complexity and Organizations Program, Open University of Holland, and was formerly an associate fellow at the University of Hertfordshire's Business School, I hope I pronounced that correctly, in the Complexity and Management Center. In his book, CBT, The Cognitive Behavioral Tsunami, Dr. Dalal offers us a powerful critique of CBT's understanding of human suffering, as well as the apparent scientific basis underlying it. The book argues that CBT psychology has fetishized measurement to such a degree that it's come to believe that only the countable counts. It suggests that the so-called science of CBT is not just bad science, but corrupt science. So with that being said, uh, Dr. Hal <laughs> Dr. Farhad, um, I I'm curious, would you mind speaking to the group about what inspired you to write this book and what the process <laughs> like for you yeah thanks um, for inviting me in all of that um i don't think the word inspired would be the right word um for the writing of this book because um, i was actually uh trying to write something else and i was just going to dip into the cognitive behavioral side of things um to write a page or two but but as i started to read about it and got more into it it just um got me more and more stirred up and i found i couldn't move on to what i actually wanted to write about so i was sort of in a way forced to um look at this in more depth and um this book um kind of expanded from from just being sort of critique of the science to more of a social commentary which then allows this kind of science and legitimates this kind of um, fake new science, I'd say. Um, so anyway, I wouldn't say I was inspired to write it, but it was more out of written out of a state of disgruntlement and, and irritation, uh, not inspiration. Hmm. Uh, thanks for sharing. I, I imagine many people that have joined Cyan have felt more so the stick aspect of um, where our profession is right now, rather than the carrot that we feel sort of forced into this position. Uh, so as you know, uh, many people met in groups and I'm wondering now, you know, does anybody have questions uh, that came up during your discussions you know, related to this really important topic that we're all facing? And for, as a reminder for those that came after I said this, you can either raise your hand physically or use the uh, the raise your hand feature, and I'll call on you to uh, ask your question or make your comment. Well, if no one has one just yet, oh, Linda, all right, yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> I was curious, um, Farhad, if you could um, uh, share with us what you know about what's going on in the UK now with and the NICE guidelines, I, um, kind of building on uh, what what's happened since since you wrote the book. I mean, yes. 
things seem pretty dire. And has that been continuing? Has there been any sort of improvements? Um, it, it continues to be dire. Um, and as you know, the uh, um, psychodynamic therapies also try to get into the act by making the practice measurable. Um, so, so there are some um, other kinds of therapy called, I think, interpersonal therapy, which is, um, anyway, they're given um, their own, own names. And, uh, but, but the situation continues in this way. Plus, the state uh, puts in less and less money because they are, um, it's all ideologically driven. So that this, the, the state we have, the government we have in the UK and I've had now for quite some time, they're sort of ideologically motivated to privatize everything, to um, dismantle the NHS and so on. So um, not only, I mean, anyway, the situation is pretty bad that there's little money being put in and what is being put in is, is very attenuated. And even if the um, treatment protocol was tested for, I don't know, 24 sessions, um, then it's, people will tend to get a lot less, you know, like six sessions or five sessions. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not good news in that way. And yeah, is that prompting people to kind of, you know, question, you know, as your book lays out, I mean, sort of the whole premise um, and to reevaluate that, that, you know, there must be a better way to, to help people? Well, I, th I think that's where science stands out because you are, uh, as an organization, you're actually engaging the politics and you are trying to get out into the media and so on. Whereas um, very little of that's happening over here. You know, people might in conversations with colleagues bemoan the state of affairs, but um, activism is not really uh, taking place here in this way. It's, it's people are more finding ways to comply rather than uh, question, mm. ways of fitting in. <clears throat> You, you also have the insurance industry that's driving this as well, don't you? Who will uh, only fund certain kinds of treatment because they are scientific. <clears throat> yes, scientific and <clears throat> medically necessary is, is kind of the big phrase here in, in the US that mm -hmm. we have to contend with. And then more corporate, uh, for-profit corporations getting into it, like Talkspace or Better Health, yeah. things like that, and saying we're evidence-based and, um, yeah, the the narrative continues. Mm -hmm. I I'm not sure if others. Um felt so strongly about this. So one, one feature of the book that I found really uh, important and something that I'll certainly hold on to with my patients and my thinking in general is um, that aspect of CBT that you mentioned in which only the countable counts and just the way in which, um, you know, the way in which so many things that we know exist yet have a difficult time measuring exactly is completely discounted because of that. And, and the tree example, you know, of these farmers that had this actual plant that they use, and then they couldn't actually um, really have any power in the courts to, to maintain their product, you know, that they were just discounted immediately. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the same um, with the idea of happiness. I don't know if you remember that in the book, because uh, Layard um, was very excited that you could see brain activity when people felt happy. That proved happiness existed. <laughs> and, and until then, it was just a subjective experience. So, um, yeah. 
And did you actually go to the happiness conference that, I mean, did you write about Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. There was one in Dartington local, locally to here. And all those things actually happened. You know, get to get free hugs here. <clears throat> I, oh, I can't tell did someone raise their hand uh wendy all right go ahead hi so i have i read the book a while ago and i haven't i wasn't involved in the discussions so i feel a little bit dis a little bit distant from it but um i'm wondering what i feel like what's happening here in private practices with people who want to do and analysis or depth therapy is it's it's just moving toward wealthy people can get this hmm. and they do so they come to us we they pay our fees some of them have out of network insurance which maybe will cover some of it but that's that's getting harder and harder for people because our our deductibles are going up and up and up and um so i just wondered if there's a similar thing do people pay out of pocket when they can afford it for something different, because it seems to me that people that I treat know have sensed the difference yeah. and want what they're getting from this. But they they're not going to, and they've even said, "Oh yeah, I went to someone in my insurance network." Well, that was silly. Or someone just told me yesterday that she had a therapist that was talking to her about her own kids and all this other stuff that verged on unethical from my perspective. Hmm. Certainly. And that's what she was getting from the in-network insurance that you know that she was going to. And I guess I'm wondering if you're seeing that too in the UK, and if others on this call agree that that's what they're seeing in their different parts of the US. Hmm. Well, um, not much therapy is funded by insurance in the UK. It's it's uh, you either get this sort of impoverished um, something on the NHS, the National Health Service or as private practice so um the the other place where people can get cheaper therapies is with trainees on trainings so there are many charitable organizations that might do i don't know domestic violence for example and they will get uh, trainees count mainly counseling trainees who will then come and work for them for pro bono basis to get their experience um, so it's kind of takes place a bit like that here, but it is it is all um, you know pe people having to pay for themselves, and um, I personally kind of I mean I'm trying to head towards retirement now, but when I had a full practice, um, I would try and you know have a part of my practice that was low fee paying, um, subsidized by the higher pay pay people. So it's just down to me how that happens. Uh, Tom has his hand up. You're muted, can't hear you. Um, yes, I, I, I was interested in the, the scene, so it, you're, you're argument is based very much on the British scene, which is so is really very different than here, mm -hmm. the economic basis. Um, with there's an economic reason to corrupt science yeah. and CBT over there. Because the government is laying it out. Whereas um, Here it's it's more subtle, and when I think of the corruptions of science, and I I agree with all of it, and I agree with the corruptions of cognitive therapy research, which I did some of, in, in years ago. Um, I it it so much more applies to pharma, where there's a huge economic incentive to get drugs approved, and everything you described about the twisting of numbers and everything else fits there. But the interesting thing about CBT, which really developed over here before it was taken up over there, yeah. was that 
there really wasn't a huge economic reason. Uh, managed care came along a little later. It was really getting pretty developed before that. Managed care exploited it as a rationale for giving very little treatment. Mm -hmm. But um, mostly it was the economics of being in a arts and sciences psychology department as a clinical researcher and getting published data. It was easy to study. And so it was, as you've described, twisted for the research. Yeah. But but there wasn't the mass economically corrupting. There wasn't a reason for an economically corrupting system to, to push everything to CBT over here, really, mm. in the way there was there. But don't, don't you, I mean, in, to my um, uh, way of thinking, it, it's more like CBT is weaponized in, in order to dismantle and, and attack the psychoanalytic worldview. Yes. Um, so the APA and you know all these organizations um, um, sign sign up to a particular worldview, um, which is hyper rationalist, cognitivist. It it fits the the um, the way society is heading, right? The quick fix, uh, take a pill for this, and so on. Um, so a, a lot of it's that sort of interprofessional rivalry. It it may also be because um at least over here long before they did in britain we sold our soul to the concept of medical treatment that therapy was a medical treatment yeah and so if you decide define something as a medical treatment you better be able to justify it getting results yeah and so cbt simplified the whole thing and said if you want results i'll show you results yeah uh, but uh, it and I and I, I worry because I I think as the psychoanalysts try to fight on that turf, they will start to lose their soul as well. Yeah. Um, by by trying to quantify and 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 justify, likewise as they turn to neuroscience. Yeah. But it, but in in that sense, psychoanalysis has sort of been partially responsible for creating the problem because it uh, and Freud, as we know, and so on, you know, declared it to be a science and his his hope that would ultimately be a kind of materialist science and so on. So it's, psych psychoanalysts have been declaring what they do as science uh, of a certain kind. And um, as you say, CBT beats them hands down of doing science. Um, Uh, jump, jumping on uh, Tom's point, um, I'm a psychiatrist, Dr. Dahl, and um, I I think part of the problem, and I don't I don't personally have a lot of insight into how this came to be, but I think part of the problem too is like, uh, uh, not only was psychotherapy uh, made it out to be this medical treatment. But if we back up even further, somehow medicine itself has gotten reduced to being about um, uh, mm -hmm. biological, mm -hmm. uh, empirical science. And there's the, 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 the art of medicine, the qualitative part of medicine. Um, all of that is no longer really um, thought of as essential to the heart of medicine. And so I, I actually just, uh, your, your book was really helpful in a presentation I, I gave at the uh, Association of Family Psychiatry Conference last weekend where <clears throat> it's like medicine itself. Um, like, like, yes, it is, I, I agree. It's, a, it's problematic that psychotherapy has been re sort of, you know, it's, it's in, we insist that it's a medical treatment, but I actually think it's even more problematic. Yeah. What we mean by medical treatment is 
the sort of straightforward application of randomized control trials to uh, patient care. Like medicine is not equivalent to to the application of randomized control trial data to you know the in, the human sitting across yeah. from me. And I'm not sure exactly how that process came to be, but um, yeah, I just I just wanted to make that comment that I think I think it's uh, I, I would nuance a little bit and say that yeah, it's it's unfortunate that what we mean by even a medical treatment in this country means means that. Mm. So. Mm. So um, uh, I don't, I don't know how this all fits together. My head sort of spinning in a lot of places, but um, there's, I, I, what I remember about your book is that you situated this in a larger economic sociopolitical context that um, all of these, these questions about CBT were really bigger questions about the economy um, that we live mm -hmm. in, neoliberal mm -hmm. economy that's ascendant right now. And, um, and I think Maybe others want to talk about this too, but there's there's something about keeping people just happy enough so they won't revolt um, mm. through these methods, whatever they are, whether it's mindfulness or CBT or I don't know, uh, or or um, better help. So they think they're getting something. So they think they're okay. So they won't really look hard at the bigger picture of what's happening to all of us. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I feel like that's in your book and mm. also sort of the bigger, or the, or the underlying or overarching, I don't know which um, piece of this that's very depressing to me because I don't see how I can fight that. Like we can fight better help in a way by mm. suing them or writing articles to the, you know, letters to the New York Times or whatever. But how do we fight these bigger forces that are controlling our lives? And I think that neoliberalism is also a part of the um, the measuring, uh, the the privileging of randomized controlled trials, and the um, and and how we no longer can accept that a case study might have something we could learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I saw that your hand was up beforehand. Oh, Stephen Berman. Uh, looking no, that. my hand wasn't up, but I'm certainly <laughs> intrigued by the direction and not surprised by the direction of this conversation. Seems to me that, uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, Dr. Fryer, uh, I do have a question around. Uh, how much political activity there is in the National Health Service to um, get health care, mental health care more covered um, in, a, in, in a broader than CBT uh, method. Um, but uh, on a parallel basis of what's being talked about, uh, here in the States, it seems to me the mental health is sort of the canary in the coal mine to what insurance companies can get away with. Um, and, you know, they've been controlling us more and more, though. Uh, Dr. Downey makes a good point that, you know, of course, medical care is, you know, also being much more driven by mm -hmm. outcomes and value based issues. Um, and if we're so overwhelmed by that, those controllers of uh, our profession, what do we do? How do we, you know, gain control of providing our services again? You know, um, do we somehow separate all medical care and mental health care uh, from insurance altogether? Um, or do we have a more public system that will be more supportive and more available to um, input from the actual practitioners? So, I don't know if that was a question there, but it's it's. I'm I'm uh, hearing you connecting with what um, Wendy was mm -hmm. uh, speaking of, which is um, that it, it that I feel more and more pessimistic because it seems to me, and I begin to feel more and more like a conspiracy theorist, 
because it seems to me all the forces in society are joining hands in a kind of elitist way. So, um, for example, the, uh, the, you will know the regulatory agencies, certainly over here, the pharmaceutical break, they're, they're all funded by pharma. Um, the World Health Organization is also, I think, 80% funded by pharma and Bill Gates and so on. So th th there's that side of things. Then our legislature, I mean, they call that um, regulatory capture, right? Where the, the regulators are captured by the industry they're supposed to be regulating. But then there's, there's also, I think, legis legislative capture, where our politicians are bought and paid for. And so they, so you've got that joining hands with that, joining hands with this. So it seems all of it is, um, it, it's, it's such a powerful uh, force. And uh, when you said, Wendy, that uh, neoliberalism was in the ascendant, I think it's actually won the war. You know, they, they totally won hands down the world. They've taken over the world. Everybody thinks in this way and legitimates their actions you know, evidence-based government, evidence-based fashion, evidence-based everything. Yeah, and people are forced to speak this language to be taken seriously. Um, I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm also uh, find parallels with, and now here I'm probably stepping into um, problematic territory, but um, for example, um, the COVID vaccine, that it was like there was only one narrative that was allowed about it and any questioning of it immediately positioned you as a crazy anti-vaxxer who was um, you know talking about Bill Gates injecting chips into you and so on um, but this is the same company that's been fined about 10 billion dollars in the last 10 20 years for you know all sorts of chicanery and they told us that their vaccine was 95% effective and it would stop the virus dead. And people questioned it. They were decreed as spreading misinformation. So there too, a whole narrative, like a unity, one narrative is pushed. You know, there are other areas of society where it seems to me uh, you're not allowed to think differently. So it's, it's, it seems to me CBT fits and, and the discourse around it is of that kind of nature. Uh, Stephen, it looked like you had raised your hand first. Yeah, I'm uh, getting a lot of getting used to the Zoom controls here. Um, so, uh, Dr. Dalal, I was curious. So it, it seems to me there's a, a uh, how to put this? I on this sort of topic, I, I'm curious if you thought at all about the rise of artificial intelligence and what that's going to do to um, uh, psychotherapy. And my sense is that the assumptions of that that the assumptions of CBT and the assumptions uh, that have led allowed CBT to rise to prominence. Um, and I th and I think that are behind some of the, I think there's other factors here, um, but I, I wonder at least if some of this is behind kind of this explosion of, of coaching in the US. I don't know if that's happening in, mm. in the UK as well, but um, I think much of, you know, the, I, I see a line from CBT to coaching, which is this idea that psychotherapy is primarily about the transfer of information, and the yeah. it's it's a it's a it's a co it's a cognitive thing that yeah. we're doing here. Um, and I think there's a very direct line, as far as I see it, now to oh well, AI can can do this and likely do it better than a lot of cognitive therapists. Mm. Um, and I was curious if you've thought at all about what what that's, if you think artificial intelligence is gonna, what, what's gonna happen? I, it makes me kind of, uh, 
things are going to get a lot worse <laughs> mm. before they get better. And I don't think they're going to get better, mm. but curious if you thought about that at all. I haven't, but, but more and more, um, the relationship is being attenuated, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. we're on the phone, we're doing it on zoom, we're, um, part, you know, chat. Um, one of the things they've done here is, um, um, you know, mobile chat, you know, so if you're feeling depressed, send a text to this thing and that's supposed to help you uh, I, I i agree with you about your sort of trajectory i think in the very early days um some person wrote a um kind of primitive i can't remember his name now but it would be decades ago a primitive computer program and um and his secretary who was typing it out or using it actually started to find it quite helpful you know with uh, little little formulas that are used that that uh, people are trained in you know when you say mm -hmm, and when you say tell me more about that and so on and so forth uh, it seemed to work you know so you got a few techniques um but even even um you know i'm at the train station and and a mechanical voice thanks me for something or cautions me about something as though there's concern about me as a person i find all of that really bizarre you know a machine is talking to me um there's three hands up yeah david if you'd like to uh ask your question so many good things are being said and thank you for hosting this and uh Dr. Farhad for being here. Um, <clears throat> I want to go back to Wendy. Uh, I'm a social worker, so my perspective on a lot of this stuff is different than a psychologist and psychiatrist because we're trained in an ecological model. You know, when we take courses, they're named uh, human behavior and social environment. And the person in situation environment is uh, a keystone of the way social workers conceptualize the work we're doing with people. It's not so much about the individual as it is about their relationships with people in their environment. And uh, I, I'm a mental health guy, you know, I help deinstitutionalize our uh, state hospitals and uh, really was a big advocate of the community mental health system, which somebody said was publicly funded. And uh, here in Rochester, New York, which is in Western New York, uh, between Rochester and Buffalo, uh, we had a great system in Monroe County. But what happened is when the federal funding dried up, uh, the state said with the money they were saving from deinstitutionalizing the institutions, they were gonna reinvest that in the community, which of course they never did. And so services increasingly dried up and, uh, <clears throat> They got medicalized. Mm. They got turned over to the private insurance companies. And then you have all the scientific crap that came in that you got to measure everything you're doing. And uh, they want you to use evidence-based therapies and all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, the point here that I wanted to make is I had a very astute colleague back in the 80s said to me, you know, Dave, you got three things here. You got Counseling, case management, and psychotherapy. The holy trinity. Uh, and that's always stuck with me. And one of the reasons I got interested in Scion, and I love Linda Michaels for starting this and the other people, is that uh, you're really emphasizing the psychotherapy. Uh, and all these AIs and this other stuff, Steve, uh, Dr. Downey, like you were talking about, is all about disease management. And the bedside manner has been thrown out the window. Mm. Well, again, as a social worker, it's all about the helping relationship and providing a corrective emotional experience for the patient, which nobody's paying you for. That, that's the, you know, you get paid for procedures, right, Steve? Mm. Uh, uh, they're not paying you to have a, so uh, here, I don't know, it's probably true there too. Uh, we make a distinction between direct services and indirect services. And uh, so if the patient's sitting there and I'm talking to them, uh, I can bill for that. But if I'm doing anything on their behalf outside of that, uh, 
I have to eat it. You know, there's nothing I can do about it. So anyway, mm -hmm. back to Wendy. Uh, I get a lot of people come in and they say things that make me cry. I mean, it's very sad. They said, well, I was on better help or talk space. And, you know, I decided I wanted to talk to a real person. Now, I don't quite know what that means. Uh, sometimes I ask them, I say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, they're giving them box breathing exercises and all this other crap, but uh, they thought talking to a real person would be helpful. Mm. Uh, well, then you're back to Wendy. Uh, who's paying for that? Now, I'm a criminal when it comes to medical records and DSM diagnosis. It's all bullshit, you know. Uh, I do it to fill in the forms and get paid, but I don't run my practice that way. Uh, I refuse to do it. So uh, I'd like to think what I'm doing is psychotherapy. But anyway, I'm sorry for going on and on. Uh, one of the things I think, bottom line here, and I'd be love to hear what other people think. I think uh, in a certain sense, we've done a very poor job describing what it is as psychotherapists that we do. You know, what is psychotherapy? What does that look like? And uh, how is it best provided? to our clients and we've been captured by the medical model and it's done us in. And we did it out of our greed and avarice. You know, we wanted the money. So everybody goes into private practice so they can bill the insurance companies and, and get the money. Well, okay, we sold our soul to the devil. And, and now we're back, uh, you know, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. What the hell have we done here? And uh, I, I think this kind of consciousness raising that you've done, uh, Farhad, is wonderful. I mean, it's just wonderful, mm -hmm. you know, kind of poking holes in this. Uh, so anyway, uh, here's my last comment. I think I'd like to think we're on uh, the, the brink of a huge paradigm shift. We've got to get ourselves out of the medical model. It doesn't work for us. It doesn't work for our patients. I don't think it works for our society. So how are you going to fund it? Well, I think of what we do is educational. You know, we're nurturers. We're trying to facilitate human growth and development. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. We're more like educators <laughs> than we are doctors. Uh, and here, I think in the UK too, uh, you know, our public school system is publicly funded through tax dollars. Uh, and teachers are making a hell of a lot more money than I am as a social worker. You know, I wish I'd gone into teaching instead of social work because uh, I'd be making 25% uh, more and have a much better benefit package mm -hmm. <laughs> and only be working 180 days a year. It'd be wonderful. But uh, I, I think we need to get to some uh, point where we redefine what we do is kind of a educational uh, process that facilitates human growth and development. And that's going to have to be uh, publicly supported. I'll shut up. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, I mean, the um, social workers here, as you describe it, um, uh, maybe at one time it was like that, relational and thinking about, whereas now they're preoccupied with lists and waiting yes. lists and throughputs and, how right. many, and triaging and moving people from one list to another list and sitting um, I have a colleague who does is trying to be an antidote to the system, and he says, um, you know, uh, a social worker will visit a home, sit there with a form, fill in the things, never ask, never actually have a conversation. Um, so, so everything is kind of heading in that direction. Well, everything that's the is, that, that's the case management. Yeah. Again, going yeah. back to the trinity of case management which is doing the form filling in and determining eligibility and uh, assessing for needs for resources and linking people and all that kind of crap. Yeah. And then you got the counseling, which is the advice giving and the coaching, which somebody, uh, and there's a, I mean, the interesting thing is there's a place for all this. I, I'd hate to see us get into a uh, adversarial situation because uh, hmm. uh, I think they're all important functions and activities. Uh, but so, I think we need to we need to be clearer about distinguishing what's what 
in yeah. case management is not the same thing as psychotherapy. Yeah. yeah. But over here, I think it's case non-management because, <laughs> yeah. because they'll go through the processes. Right. And then nothing happens. Right. Or you end up on a waiting list for three years or That's something. Right. So uh, it, it's a way of making it seem like you're doing something without actually doing anything. But I also, you know, when you said um, we are very bad at describing what psychotherapy is, um, I'm heading the other way in that I find it more and more mysterious, whatever this process is. Uh, it's something more in the ineffable. And um, I can't tell you what's, what happens. And if somebody does improve, um, or in, what does that mean? Let's say they're more fulfilled. Um, happier whatever I have no way of saying that's because of anything that's happened in the therapy room you know I have no way of pinning that down and nor do I want to um, but then I'm in this comfort zone where I am a, a psychotherapist in private practice you know I'm not answerable to anybody in that sense I'm not answerable to the authorities and if another citizen uh, comes to me of their own free will and we make this arrangement that's fine I don't need to explain myself any further but um, but that's kind of easy for me to say and somewhat avoidant um, anyway um, somebody else yeah, I'll talk to you at your hand raise for some time so um, um, I had a question um, I was wondering one of the things uh, you mentioned, we don't quite have in the U.S. Uh, the, at least in my experience, the 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 set limitation on the number of sessions. This isn't quite my experience with insurance companies or with the public insurance companies. So, mm -hmm. so um, we do have questions would come up if you see uh, a patient maybe. Uh, three or four times a week. Um, you might see them um, twice a week. Usually there, in my experience, there isn't a question raised. But more than that, I think there will be questions raised. But I haven't had the experience of the, the limitation of, of actual number of sessions. Mm -hmm. But there are uh, therapists who certainly work that way. So they will provide, whether they are uh, working in insurance or private uh, uh, pay, um, working with that model that they will only provide a certain number of sessions and that's their their way of working my question is now you in the uk have that and perhaps we'll move that way in the us what happens when the patient wants to come back how often can they come back to 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 therapy do they is is it like well 20 sessions is over. Now you take a break for one session, one month, and then can you go back? Because in my experience that there are folks who, who do go through like the 8, 10 session model and, and then after a few months feel that they, well, they need more help. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, they make, so they may go back to their, their insurance and find another therapist mm. and the same thing seems to happen with, with public insurance with medical that folks would would then go back and and probably then come across someone who who, who doesn't have that model and mm. then they stay for for <clears throat> until they feel that that is enough whatever that subjectively means to yeah to yeah and I'm wondering how this works, where there is a set number of sessions, then what happens after that? Yeah, I suppose, um, first thing, the number of sessions is often initially dictated by the manual. So the mm. treatment that's been tested, you know, so they will do 24 sessions, say. Um, so that means that's what you should get, because that's been tested and shown to work. So you should get 24 but that becomes diluted that that's one thing um so over here it's um we're talking about um treatment uh, provided by the state but what the state has done is that they've um outsourced 
this. So the private companies then make arrangements with the NHS and they get uh, paid in this way. And what tends to happen um, from um, my understanding from speaking to people in the field is that when people can, can come to the end of their 10 sessions or 20 sessions, generally they would be positioned as having recovered from the illness, whatever it is. And this is measured by questionnaires, right? So I put up a couple of questionnaires in the book. I can't remember them now, but if you score more than 10, you're depressed. If you score less than 10, you're recovered. So generally they'll find a way to position this person as having recovered. Then when they, so then it's a success and they get paid for that. When this person comes back, they're not allowed to see the same practitioner. Um, they have to see a new practitioner. And in this way, it's a separate, it's a new case. So the statistics will show two successes, not one failure, and two sets of payments. So th this is part of the corruption of the system, that, that, that people learn to game the system. Um, and um, anyway, the, all sorts of things like this go on. But the number of sessions, as far as I understand it, initially is determined by the manual you're using. You know, session one, you do this, session two, you do that, and so on and so forth. When you get to the end of the manual, it ends, and you've obviously recovered because the manuals, it's scientifically proven that you will. So. Okay, I, I understand. It's that's, uh, and so, so, so there's no even, um, they can't even go back to the same or don't to the same therapist who is treating them. So no, they have to start, to start new. So yeah. the relationship is not valued at all. Not at all. Not it doesn't count. It's the treatment that counts. You so you know, it's like I go to a different barber uh, tomorrow, and the next one, it doesn't matter to me. It's the barber. You know, he cuts my hair. I don't. Um, ah, okay. All right. So it's the therapist. <laughs> and and of course, people coming in to therapy can also think of me in that kind of a way, mm. you know, and sometimes I find I'm in a deeper relationship with the person sitting across from me than they are with me. You know, mm. they might suddenly say, well, I'm going to stop today. What? Mm. You know, but I thought I was in a relationship with you, but they thought of me as the barber. Mm. Um, if you'd like to ask your question. Sure. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to say, I've read some of Thought Paralysis and read all of this book, and I am blown away by your ability as a teacher because you you made more clear the scientific method and the measurement and the problems with it so lucidly. I, I, I studied at Penn in, in Seligman's department um, with all of that, never as, as, as cogent, as clear as, as that critique, but you had to teach yourself that because that's obviously not what you've been doing for 30 years. And I'm just, the scope of what you've done in this book, and then to look at thought paralysis about about um, the virtues of discrimination, about um, uh, diversity and equity, uh, it's just remarkable, um, your talent as a teacher. I just oh, wanted to say that. Thank you. It's very kind. Thank you. About, about, we are indeed all being pushed toward evidence from neoliberalism, but the interesting thing is that only in one direction, because careful looking like you did and others have done at the basis of the CBT evidentiary basis um, shows that the evidence is that it's not helpful. Likewise, yeah. we are all taught about the evidence um, evidence-based medicine and, and pharma. And now with Whitaker and his group carefully analyzing both the corruption that got most all of the drugs approved and the evidence that in the long-term they make more chronic 
and more severe the problems that in the short term they seem to help. But that is almost not registering. Hmm. So it, you know, it, it's evidence, but there's something else because evidence doesn't compel people. There have to be market interests like pharma and market interests in ignoring the evidence. It's, it's, yeah. And, and I think there's also something larger than even managerialism. I, I take this from Heidegger is the, just the technologization of the, of the self that all yeah. thought has become reduced to calculative thought. Yeah. How do I make my, so, you know, 10, 15 years ago, patients came to me and talked about their problem their, with their boyfriend. Now they come to me and they say, uh, I think I'm a um, uh, borderline personality, or I, they, you know, they, 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 they come with their symptoms. Yeah. That they, they have adopted their self-understanding has been taken over and how to fix myself, how to yeah. change. It's all about changing yourself, which I don't think therapy is about. Um, but yeah. Anyway. Um, I have, if I may, um, I have a quote. Um, this is by a um, moral philosopher called Raymond Gaita, G-A-I-T-A. And I'll just read this quote out because it um, speaks to what you've just said. So he says this, if our understanding... No, if our understanding of our inner life is and its actuality are interdependent, if the concepts with which we identify and explore our inner life partly determine the character of that inner life, then a scientific distortion of those concepts will not only distort our understanding, it will distort the inner life as well. Yes. So, you know, we, we, uh, I heard some years ago about a website called the Quantized Self, and I thought it was um, an ironic thing, but actually it turns out to be a place where people are measuring themselves in all kinds of fragmentary ways um, as, a, as a virtuous thing, as an exciting thing to be doing. Um, so anyway, just uh, agreeing with your point. I'm sorry, what was that website called? The, quant the quantized self, something quantized like that. Self. Okay. You know, so quite in, in chunks, be whatever, um, you know, whatever your heart rate, you running for 10 minutes and measuring this and that. And, um, wow. but, but you be, become reduced to sets of measurements. And, and oh. our practice becomes to tweak those numbers, um, not, not about our sensibilities yep isn't that what's happening with like everybody's so i there's now a ring you can wear that measures all sorts of things your heart rate your sleep your whatever but ever and so many people have a watch oh you have one <laughs> the watch that they wear that measures all and then it's like someone was telling me i can tell how much i slept and i said i thought don't you know by how tired you are in mm. the morning if you slept well or not you you need a ring to tell you how you know, you slept, but um, I'm, I, just, I just want to jump in, Wendy. I know yeah. so in the new version of um, the software, Apple has just announced that they're going to be including mental health measures in the software. So you can track your mood, you know, a lot of these sort of CBT kind of tracking things. So right on your iPhone or your Apple Watch or whatever, it's going to be built into the software. You won't even have to download a separate app. So, I mean, it's really... And then, next, sorry, the yeah. next step will be, you'll get an ad for what you need to fix that problem. Whatever, you need this drug or you need that. Yeah. <laughs> you need to join this gym and pay a membership so you can get more steps or what, you know, that's, it's just all... Yeah, it's where it's I know interesting. You now have your talk space ad right here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for, um, I just, um, I won't take up too much time, but I, I wanted to go back to David's point about who we are, which is a really interesting question. And I had, when you first said, I, you think we are educators, I had like a reaction. No, I'm not. Like, I don't want to think of myself that way. But 
um, because I do think of it as a healing profession. But then I don't know, like, I don't know how it works or whether it's what I do that helps or not. Um, I work with some young children in a school and sometimes people think I did some miracle and I'm like, they just grow up sometimes. They just, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe I did something, but uh, I just, I just think it's an interesting question and maybe it's relevant to all of what we're talking about to think about how do we present ourselves? What is our identity as a psychotherapist or depth therapist? How do we, how do we talk to people about that? Uh, you mm. know, are we educators? Are we healers? Um, we're, we're all talking today or a number of people about maybe it wasn't a great idea to sign up for the medical model. Um, you know, but here we are. Can we can we get rid of that? How do we do that? But anyway, so that I just wanted to respond, just think a little bit about that question of our identity. I'm not sure where I fall on it or if I want to agree with you that it's that we're educators or should be. But it is like part of the problem is this question of who we are. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Hank, it looks like you have your hand raised. Yeah, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Let's see, I just misplaced something. Um, thank you for uh, this whole discussion. And I didn't read, I didn't take part of the, the discussion group or read the book, and I haven't read your book, but uh, I'm going to look at it in more detail. I know, I just found out about this. But uh, I get the sense that you've done a very wonderful thorough job but let's see if where my piece of paper is but oh well i uh, what this got me thinking about it, i was listening oh yeah here we are i was listening to uh, uh, a zoom cast uh, sponsored by the ipa journal book club and the the uh the the two speakers were uh J Jonathan Shedler a psychologist and Jack Drescher whom i think a lot of people know in this country uh, and uh, the title was a catchy title. It says uh, that Jonathan Shedler wrote, uh, wrote about and spoke about. That was then, uh, this is now psychoanalytic psychotherapy for the rest of us. And what they were talking about was like, you're laying, you're one of the people laying the groundwork for what I think they're suggesting is that the depth psychology community get together and stop fighting amongst each other first, come with some uh, more understandable language for the public, and also uh, you know begin to stop uh, fighting for territory within the group. Now, they're here in the States. I don't know what's going on in Britain as much. But they also talk about, so they, they talk about the enemy within, which is everything that everybody's been talking about, including what you've researched and about uh, making a buck. I don't know if it's neoliberal, but it's, uh, it's very destructive uh, for the sake of uh, making a buck, uh, creating status, uh, uh, creating fabulous quick fixes. You know, not that these techniques are not useful, but there's no adequate public metapsychology as well as description, of what depth therapy does. And then we're, then we're talking about the enemy without is all of these people competing for, you know, who's gonna get the better app and who's gonna, uh, who's gonna get this done and this done. So I'm suggesting following up on what these people, oh yeah, by the way, there's Jonathan Shedler, he's got a website and uh, his whole talk and a few articles that he wrote about sort of, uh, we'll call it uh, psycho depth therapy, social justice is what I'll call it. And I think what I'm hearing today is you're laying some of the groundwork for uh, an insight, uh, a depth look at how the, uh, the cognitive behavioral stuff is, uh, is sort of, uh, tricking us mm -hmm. to saying we got it or 
or you know, top-down, bottom-up therapy, which is really good. I'm not concerned about the value, but nobody's getting together and saying, hey, we're here to help people. We know there are forces that work against it, but let's us as a community, and now with Britain, I know a more international community, I guess we need people mostly who speak English, you know, not just South, you know, Spanish. So I just wanted to share that it's worth looking at this Jonathan, S-C-H-E-D-L-E-R, I guess, dot com or something, and take a look at what th this group of people is trying to build upon. Hmm. So that's that's my general observation. But thank you for the discussion you. and your fabulous work at uh, outing all this stuff, you know. Hmm. Thanks. Matthew, you've had your hand raised for some time. You're, you're muted. I'm unmuting. You're okay, I can figure it out. Uh, so yeah, I've had it off and on. Um, but yeah, I was going to, Wendy brought it up again. So I wanted to kind of, again, speak to this ambivalence about the idea of being an educator and this idea of knowledge itself. Um, before becoming a therapist, I did community organizing and I was using a lot of Paulo Freire's uh, critical pedagogy and whatnot, where he makes this distinction between a banking model of education where brains are empty and they're given the the knowledge that then goes off as opposed to this dialogical process where we take our lived experience between us and we discuss it until we make our own knowledge out of our own lived experience mm. and so i think that you know in the same sense here cbt really is like the banking model on steroids basically like we have the expert knowledge we know how you work and it is this kind of suppression of the subjectivity. You're like, you're, you're not fulfilling your aims. You're kind of inhabiting someone else's aims at that mm. point, you know, and someone else's truth. So I think that I, I would feel like a little weird about the educator thing, unless I, until I thought about this more dialogical model, which is where I've got, which is all based on the relationship again. Mm. So. And that's, that's where notion of emergence is really important and useful that what happens emerges between us you know our the phrases we use like co-creating and so on that they are um, an, an antidote to the banking model um, absolutely but i i was also um when hank was speaking i was also thinking about how uh, certainly in the uk and maybe i think also in america psychoanalysis has sort of been part of the problem, created the problem, because it has been pretty elitist in the sense of, you know, being in a five times a week analysis and to be able to afford that and so on. And, you know, an, an analyst will seek 20 people or something over a lifetime um, in full analysis. So it, it so in that sense, psychoanalysis sort of ignored the common person. And that's where, um, CBT and behaviorism and so on, they come in and say, you know, here's something easy, we, we are attending to you, we know. So this elitism, I think, um, has caused, been a part why it's uh, left the field open for CBT to sweep into it. Um, also wanted to say to David, you said educator, I also thought priest you know, in, in the idea of, uh, not in the sense of healing, of preaching, I mean, but 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 some kind of presence, you know. Uh, um, I don't know, I, don't, I genuinely, I'm not being modest, I genuinely don't know what happens, to, but some moments are, feel very meaningful to me and to the other person. And uh, that seems to me to be it. But I, I cannot... Um, give it any form or shape or uh, I cannot speak to it. You know, I was, I can say I was moved. You know, so what is, is a riposte, but it felt meaningful. And for me, that's enough. And for the person, it's enough. They feel something has happened, but we cannot give it, name it. And the, the, the other problem is, uh, I see is that the la language has been co-opted. So, um, you know, I might say I'm 
do not subscribe to the biomedical worldview, but um, to talk to other people, I end up using terms like mental illness and mental health that um, are anathema to me, you know, because it's as soon as I use that, I bought into the mental biomedical model to talk about mental health, not human suffering, not that, you know, my life circumstances make me unhappy. Um, and then um, these ways of thinking then decree my, uh, diagnose my unhappiness as a mental illness in me. So I, I have a real problem, even the language of mental health seems to me to be deeply problematic. Um, but how to talk, you know, these are the words that are available to us now. I, uh, I liked what you said about your honesty about like, I'm not sure what happens in psychotherapy. Um, I, I'm starting, I mean, part of me thinks that, that this push for evidence base and showing that psychotherapy works and improves people's mental health, um, it loses, in my opinion, how, how, what I see the role of psychotherapy, which is psychotherapy is what you do when nothing else has worked. You don't go to psychotherapy because you know it's going to work. You go there because nothing else has. There's no guarantee it's going to get you a certain place or make you feel a certain way. It, it, I almost think of like an analogy between, um, you know, psychotherapy is more like apophatic theology than it is like cataphatic theology it's 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 the you're it, it's it's like you go in um and, and i think i think an honest psychotherapy also admits uh its uselessness with regard to certain things that may bring somebody into psychotherapy mm -hmm. some of the what, existential what? What were the two terms he used? Can you explain? Oh, uh, apophatic versus like cataphatic theology. So cataphatic is like all the things theologians say about the metaphysical, about God, all the all the positive, yeah. uh, all the all the. Uh, this is what is going on metaphysically, and then apophatic theologians are the ones who come along and say even the words we use to speak about the metaphysical, we have no idea what we're even saying. We don't know what that means. It's clearing space for, um, and I, I'm not, I don't particularly subscribe to any of that anymore, but um, just an analogously, I yeah. think, of, at least within the family of medicine, that's kind of, I see psychiatry as kind of like, this should be the place where instead of saying you have an infection with staph aureus, you need this psychiatry and specifically psychotherapy should be the space of saying, I have no idea. I don't pretend to know what's going on with you. I don't pretend to know the way out of this. And anybody who does is lying to you, but I'm happy to sit across from you and we can, we can try to find a way through this together. Whether we get there or not remains to be seen. But instead, psychotherapy is becoming like, no, no, we need it to be like infectious disease. Mm. It needs to be that. And I think uh, that I, I really I haven't heard people really talk about it like you have. Even Shedler, you know, he's very much about there is an evidence base for psychodynamic therapy. Um, you need to kind of clarify your goals at the outset of what therapy is about. That's what leads to a lot of treatment resistance. Yeah. If you don't do that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just find myself more and more being like, I don't, I don't agree with that. <laughs> yeah. just, uh, how could you possibly know what you're actually doing in here? You know? Yeah. Or where you'll get to. Yeah. In, in my, my uh, professional institution in the codes of conduct, it, it says that as a practitioner, I should be clear about the dangers and, and the outcomes at the start. And this is a psychodynamic setting. So, you know, they too are talking the language of outcomes and competencies and skills and... Um, uh, actually, yeah, 
was just remembering when I was invited to um, give a talk to the Scion conference pre-COVID that I was given a form by Scion that asked me to fill in something about, uh, you know, what, what, I can't remember the phrase, but what will people get out of this sort of thing? Um, so how, you know, what a question, how can I tell what a hundred and whatever people will get out of this thing? Um, but even Scion is, you know, succumbs to that because it has to uh, meet other criteria for other professional institutions and so on. I need so, to know that my relationship with you isn't going to be a waste of my time before yeah, we even yeah, give it a shot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But once when I said pretty much what you just said, Stephen, about the work, I don't know and I don't know. And uh, the person said, thanks very much. I'm off to somebody who does know. <laughs> Of course, you'll be out of a job real quick. <laughs> I've noticed one particular challenge we haven't necessarily touched on much is that aside from the institution that we're speaking about, so many of the people we work with crave, particularly when they're stressed or anxious, concrete ways to feel better in the near future. Hmm. And I found that <clears throat> many people that I work with will essentially say to me this is this is painful this is taking a long time you know we might be several months in or a year in or two years in it's taking a long time and at this point I want something concrete that I know will make me feel better basically mm. by next week you know and I want you to give that to me or else you know I don't know that this will work you know fortunately most people I think come to understand you know these quick fixes are really the thing that's maintained a lot of the anxiety. It's just interesting that the thing CBT preaches, which is, let's say, exposure therapy, practicing these different things that you know, help them get out of this, it is in a sense, that, like the exposure therapy is maintaining so much of the anxiety they claim to say gets rid of by giving them the concrete, by maintaining these same defenses they've had beforehand. Um, it, it just, I find it very difficult sometimes with certain people to help them understand that this might take, you know, it's a long process, a lengthy process where we endure pretty painful emotions. And it's so much harder because there are so many places, commercials, institutions that essentially say, well, we can fix that with a pill. You don't have to go spend that money and spend all those hours doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then don't you find, I find so many people will eventually come to conclude that that doesn't work. Like they'll say, oh, well, I tried this breathing and I tried that and does it work? Because I don't give that to them, but then they get it someplace else. And then they, and then I said, oh, did that work for you? No, mm -hmm. it's most often the answer for all these, uh, including the medication. A lot of times mm -hmm. they, they'll say that doesn't work. It makes no difference. Mm -hmm. Some people say it does, but not, not a lot. Anyway, that's... And if it works, great, right? I, oh. Yeah, well, folks, you know, what's, what's quite wonderful about this uh, interchange, this dialogue, is that we're talking amongst ourselves in private and we're not dealing with the, uh, the culture that we're surrounded by and the context. And in particular, yeah, we can do our work, especially if you're in private practice, within reason, without, uh, if you stick to pretty much to the code of ethics, there is some freedom. But uh, we're in, comp in a, so in the privacy, we can talk about uh, some really fabulous things that people are saying about, like we don't know. Well, we really don't know, but that's sort of like saying, well, uh, like in theology, well, you have to go by faith. Faith can be defined as it's something that can or cannot be proved, proven. So how do you communicate in, in our consulting room and maybe in a, if we teach or you work in a clinic where you have some contact with others, um, that's possible. But it, it's like saying take mental health services on faith, uh, which we know there is something not providence, but uh, there's, there's no proof. But how do we communicate that to the public and how do you deal with lobbying and financial interest and, and mostly status interest like, 
you know, I got the best deal for you. It's like we're all going to be car salesmen. Well, I got the best car. It's got the best outside, but the inside's a lemon or we don't know. So I do appreciate this private dialogue, but I'm not sure. I'm not really a, a social change guy, so I'm not sure how to get this across to a more in a more universal way other than in our private world. I would, I would say where the analogy breaks down for me is that um, in religion, they want you to take metaphysical beliefs by faith. And all I'm asking in psychotherapy, if you want to call it faith, but um, is that there be space to acknowledge that sitting across from another human uh, that you can see and and hear and there, there's a there is an empirical material reality to it in other words that's where the analogy breaks down i don't need an evidence base to tell me that sitting across from a human and having a conversation work talking about working through some things is beneficial i mean if we if we so so that's where the analogy breaks down for me i'm asking for for the insurance companies not to demand an evidence base for something we already experience whereas religions asking me to have faith in something that you may or may not experience um that's kind of a little difference that i would point out yeah but um oh go ahead sorry. sorry um just to say that that i um was thinking along similar lines that in therapy the key factor is experience so i start out with somebody and they don't know and i don't know but then we have an experience and maybe even the word beneficial is a word too far. Uh, maybe what we can say is that something happens that's meaningful. Uh, so there's an experience which keeps somebody coming because it's okay, just to stay with the private practice uh, modality, there's, there's no compulsion on people to stay. They can leave, particularly if they're paying the money themselves. So it's, it's experience that keeps people coming and 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 they and people will say things like well i feel better but i don't know why you know and i don't know why but some some things um we're, we're right now we're running a um group um psychotherapy program in india and um people say after a year or two well i, I this course is shit but my life's quite different you know, or some some version of that, that that but but something has changed. I don't know where or how or why, um, and we don't know. But the experience keeps people connected, and and I think because the experience is meaningful rather than beneficial. I want to play devil's advocate and argue with you, please. Uh, would you mind I, if I, I think I think we know very well what works. Uh, we 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 just forgot. Carl Rogers taught us this in the '60s. He said the three uh, therapeutic ingredients was unconditional positive regard, warmth, and therapist congruence. Now, to some extent, uh, you can certainly describe those qualities, uh, and I think probably to some extent you could measure them. Edwin Friedman, who was Murray Bowen's disciple there, said the most therapeutic thing, in his opinion, was a non-anxious presence. Hmm. I call it kiss the boo-boo therapy. So people come to see me, and I, I'm doing my initial assessment, and I say, you know, when you're really down and out and you're feeling like crap, who can you turn to? Who, who knows you're suffering? And very often there's nobody. That's why they're sitting in my office. Hmm. And, and I think the most uh, powerful thing we do is just offer a shoulder to cry on. We're, we're that non-anxious presence. Alice Miller called it an enlightened witness. Misery loves company. I mean, people wanna know that somebody else knows the trouble they've seen. 
Now, the last thing I wanted to share with you is, again, there's been a lot of research on this and the common factors uh, says that there's four things that lead to a good outcome. 40% uh, which are extra therapeutic. There are things that happen that don't have anything to do with the therapy. Somebody fell in love, they got a new job, they won the lottery, who the hell knows, but we don't have control over that. Uh, but it's things that have happened outside the therapy. 30% uh, is based on the helping relationship. You know, if we've developed a good therapeutic alliance and the client feels understood and that we're a safe place for them to come to talk about what they really think, how they really feel and what they really want, that's a very unique experience. And uh, so 30% uh, of a good outcome is just the quality of the helping relationship. 15% is what they call, I love this, hope and expectancy which is the placebo effect. So if I was in Britain and somebody said they were looking for a good psychoanalyst, do I know any? And I said, yeah, you wanna go talk to Dr. Farhad uh, Dalal. Uh, he's the best, he's great, very good guy. You get out a, a lot out of meeting with him. Oh, I just did 90% of your work for you. Uh, you know, they're gonna come in and they're gonna think that, uh, you know, you're like Jesus Christ almighty. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Uh, and then the last 15% is based on the, the uh, therapist skill. So I always thought that was very interesting. 40% of a good outcome is extra therapeutic factors. 30% is on the helping relationship. 15% is on hope and expectancy. And 15% is on uh, therapist skill and competence. Now, the last little anecdote I wanna tell you, I, I've been a big fan of narrative therapy. Uh, for the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years, uh, Michael White came all the way from Australia to Rochester, New York, and he's sitting there, uh, you know, giving a workshop to about 200 people. University of Rochester is here in Rochester with the medical school and all that. And, uh, you know, they have a PhD psychology program and all that stuff. Uh, so somebody nails him. He's up on the stage. He's asking for questions. And uh, some young guy, he, he must have been a doctoral student or something. He raises his hand and he says to Michael, he says, uh, to what extent is narrative therapy research based? And Michael kind of shuffled around. He's walking around on the stage. There's this long pause. And I started to get a little nervous for him because he'd been put on the spot. And then he says something I'll never forget. He says, uh, well, I'm a clinician. I'm not a researcher. And whether it's research-based or not, I'll leave to you and the other researchers. But I'm not even concerned about it. He says, narrative therapy is ethically based. I wanted to run up on the stage and hug him and kiss him. I'm thinking, what a great answer. <laughs> So we're, we're being pressed into showing that the procedures we engage in with patients and clients is research-based. Well, are they ethically based? Hmm. All right. And that gets us a uh, circle all the way back to Rogers. Is there unconditional positive regard? Is there warmth? Is there uh, uh, therapist congruence? Uh, you know, those are ethical concerns. And what people want more than anything is to know that there's somebody there for them, that uh, when they're down and out and they're suffering, uh, they can, they have a place to turn. They have somebody to go to. And uh, very often it, it, it winds up being us. Now, how you communicate that in a commodified, objective way that you can sell it to people, I don't know. But I know what that feels like, and I do it every day. Uh, and you get all kinds of feedback from people, yeah. uh, you but know, they, whether whether yeah. they felt understood and, uh, you know, they had trust in the therapist. They felt it was a safe place to come. OK, I, I'll shut up. No, but Go just ahead. to because you're, you're saying and being you are being devil's advocate. The, the, the problem I have with, say, um, Rogers's conditions, mm -hmm. uh, I can read about it, but I cannot practice unconditional regard. Mm -hmm. I cannot do it. Um, sure you can. I mean, no. we were taught in social work over and over no, I, again I, I, yeah, that we have to have a non-judgmental attitude. It's yeah, very hard I, to do, but once you're aware of it, 
I can't uh, do it. You, you can keep your non-judgment in check. No, I can't do it. And, and what's more, I think um, it's ethical. I would counter that. I would say it's my ethical duty to be sincere and authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't do uh, unconditional positive regard and be congruent because if I think <laughs> you're doing something wrong and bad, I am. There's there's going to be the the two conditions cannot work together. They are in conflict, and the only solution to it is for me to be authentic, which means I won't be unconditionally positively regarding what you're doing because I think it's wrong or crazy or harmful or unethical or terrible. So I feel I have to. Um, my view is that as a therapist, um, I need to be more transparent and present than the theories allow for. So I have a different kind of um, thing to it. So uh, I'm just going to jump in here because we're we're pretty much done with this. Um, first, I, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, for for joining us today, it really means a lot. I think for everyone who's either participated in the book club, read the book, or is just interested in the topic in general, uh, you know, one thing that it seems we're pointing to is the importance of having people learn about their emotional world and how to trust what their body is telling them. You know, how to make sense of what their body and their mind, their emotions, mm. is telling them. so they can make sound decisions based on what feels meaningful or right to them which is something that's sort of uh, the antithesis of CBT, which tells them that they know better. I mean, that the uh, therapist knows better about what's right for them. Uh, before we all leave today, and I'm sorry to those that still have their hand raised, I think we're not going to be able to get to those today. Um, you know, I just want to make a quick plug. I, I'm representing the membership team for Cyan. Should you ever be curious about getting more involved with Cyan, please feel free to reach out to membership at cyan.org. Cyan uh, is directly involved in helping advance depth therapy uh, to make it more accessible for others. Um, I, I do want to finish by asking you, uh, Dr. Dalal, if you have any any sort of uh, final words or recommendations for those that are interested in this topic and wanting to be more involved. You know, one aspect could be being involved with Cyan, but I'm curious if you have any other any other thoughts. um oh, too big a question too big too big a question um i i feel from uh, there's not answering a question but i um you know it has to be some kind of political activity some 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 sort of activism and i'm very bad at that you know so i'll sit at my desk and write my little bits and pieces but i think what sign is doing getting out there into the world um getting published, having articles, you know, for, um, um, just before coming on here, for some reason, um, I was looking at Scientific American Online, and it has um, so many articles about, talks about CBT as a proven scientific um, treatment system, you know, Scientific American. So, um, would I, you know, have I got the time now to um, think about one of these articles and write a letter back to them? Um, I don't, but that'd be the kind of thing one might do. Um, anyway, um, I don't really give you a proper answer. No, Sorry. That, that's all right. I think it's a difficult question that not many have had a good answer for, uh, other than I feel like Cyan has been on top of that. Yeah. So um, either way, I, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. This meeting will be, uh, we, we've recorded it, so we'll put it, um, I don't know if we're going to put it on YouTube or send it out to our membership to make it available. Uh, and other than that, I believe we're going to be reading Advancing Psychotherapy for the Next Generation for our next book club. That is the book that Cyan has actually written and put out there for us. So we'll have more information about that in August and really appreciate everyone joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank Bye -bye. you, Sayan, for doing this. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Max. Thanks, Farhad. Take care. Bye. Stay in Bye -bye. touch. Bye, yeah. everyone. Bye-bye.